Well, hello, Union Church of Manila and everyone tuning in for this service of worship and celebration. It is great to be together once again for such a time as this to worship um, the Lord Jesus Christ, to give thanks, to hear from Him and His Word, and to celebrate our faith together. Uh, just a few announcements or reminders for us today. I uh, want to just continue to extend the invitation If you would like to know more about Jesus Christ, this one whom we proclaim, you know, if you're if you've been tuning in to worship and you want to know more about Jesus, you're not you're not yet uh, you know quite quite believing in Him and following Him. You want to know more about what that is, what that means, um, what it what a what a faith journey of faith looks like. We would love to follow up with you. We would love to be in contact with you. With you, please just um, leave us an email, and we would follow up with you at ucmcares.unionchurch. It should be on the screen there, and we will monitor that email and come back to you promptly. Yes, that means you. If you're tuning in and, and you and you feel like you would like to respond, please do, please do, please do. This church, Union Church, would love to meet you in that discernment and that interest and need uh, right away. So we'll we'll look forward to hearing from you. Uh, also, a reminder about our uh, nominations, uh, the nominations for uh, people to serve on the church council for next year coming up. I want to remind everyone, if you would like to nominate someone to serve on the church council, if there's somebody that you you know, resonate with that you would like to put their name forward, forward uh, now is the time to do that. We invite you, encourage you to find the nominations page on the Union Church website. There you can learn about what is this process. The form is there to download and print. And also there's a video there that will sort of illuminate this process and why it's important to to be discerning as a community and to put people's names forward for leadership in the church council. So please have a look at that. Um, and nominate anyone that's been on your heart and mind as you prayerfully consider um, supporting the church and its leadership in the coming year. Uh, also, a reminder about giving. Just want to continue to let people know there, there are multiple ways to give as we try to make that known uh, on a regular basis uh, as people are tuning in, new people are tuning in from time to time. Uh, we have the direct bank deposits um, uh, avenue, online funds, transfer, um, is available on our on our website. Just you can find it there, and you can still drop off giving at any time at UCM. The Rada entrance guards will ha- be happy to assist you uh, if you want to come by and leave giving here. Uh, one more reminder is about next Sunday, um, not today, but one more Sunday. One one Sunday from today will be our communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month in November. Just inviting, reminding everyone to prepare bread and juice uh, for communion that day, that we will celebrate that day together, and uh, you can be prepared um, for that time uh, in advance. We are uh, introducing a U- our next UCM seminar that we call ucm uh, That is coming up soon. It's called Red Med, and we're going to learn in this seminar how to be ready for emergencies and disasters. Uh, We have a video that you can watch and learn more about it. Let's watch the video. Hello everyone, Noel Eason here, inviting you all to Red Med, our second installation in the hashtag Red or Ready for Emergencies and Disasters webinar series brought to you by Union Church of Manila and Alpha 3 Crisis Management. This time, we're talking about CPR and first aid for medical emergencies that could happen in the home, the workplace, the public place, or even on the road. The webinar happens on the 31st of October, 2020, 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Admission is free. To register, please scan the QR code or email ucminar at unionchurch.ph. Red Med, I hope to see you there. Well, we, we hope that this seminar will be useful to many people and look forward to uh, many signing up for this important um, seminar. Uh, let's, let's now, let's pray. Let's, let's come together in heart and mind once again and pray as we continue along in our worship service today. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for another, another week that we've been given. Uh, no doubt, combination of, of difficulty and challenge. How can there not be in this season of pandemic? Uh, there also is your grace and your faithfulness. We're reminded of that your faithfulness once again, Lord, that you are still faithful. Things are difficult and challenging. Lord, you have not forgotten your people. You are there. We know your grace, or grace and we know your faithfulness. So, Lord, continue, would you, to be faithful uh, to this Union Church of Manila and this time of worship. And Lord, let us be faithful. Let us be faithful as we worship you wholeheartedly as the one who is truly faithful, faithful no matter what. Help us to grow in our faithfulness and worship you. We honor you. We revere you. We love you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. All God's people praise you and say amen. Amen. See my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I'll lay at your feet. I'll see through the
Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let us pray. We come to you, our Lord. We are your people, one in spirit, here to worship you. We worship you for you are the creator of all things, master of all creation, and savior of our souls. You truly are worthy of our praise, worthy of our love as you have first loved us. As we acknowledge that your ways are higher than ours, better than ours, we seek your will for our world, for our community, and for our lives. And as we seek your will, we pray that we have the mind to obey you, because we know that you will keep our path straight. You want for us a good life, so you will not lead us astray. Lord, our world is hurting and by our own doing. You made your instructions clear, and yet we chose to disobey. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for sometimes choosing lifestyles that you have made clear are displeasing to you. We pray that as we claim to be your followers, we also commit to obey you and fulfill your design for us. After all, you looked at all that you had made, including us, and you saw that we were good by your design. Thank you, Lord, for designing us good and for giving us what is good. We thank you that in the midst of all the ominous headlines, the death rates from disease, you still work miracles of healing. We will never understand how you choose whom to heal and whom to take home. We just know that you are in control of everything and you have called us to rejoice, so we rejoice. But Lord, we know that in the economic slowdowns, the losses of livelihood, the losses of lives, our brothers and sisters inside and outside of UCM have felt pain. We know that you love them too, Lord, and that you will bring them help. We offer ourselves to your service to bring these people help. And Lord, if some of these people in need are part of our congregation, please let us be sensitive. Please show them to us and use us to help address their needs. And Heavenly Father, we pray for our government leaders. Touch their hearts so that they will lead the people, the people you have put in their charge, and not just lord it over their people. Give them an attitude of compassion and take away any appetite for corruption. May they truly be servant leaders following your example. And may we, your people, be united in the pursuit of justice, in loving mercy, and walking humbly with you. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. i
good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We would like to welcome you to UCM's Sunday worship service. And wherever you're tuning in from or whenever you're tuning in, we are just delighted that you have chosen to be here with us to uh, study scripture and to worship with us and sing songs of praise and glorify the Lord together with us uh, in this venue this morning afternoon or evening. And so we are in the midst of a series in Colossians. We're in Colossians chapter 2, and we'll be taking a look at three verses in particular this morning in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And uh, so if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open your Bible to that text as we uh, break apart that text together uh, uh, as we study the scriptures and look to what the Lord might want to teach us today. Well, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and invite him into this time and uh, ask him to speak to us as we go through this text together. Lord, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for the work, Lord, that you will do in us today as you speak to us. We pray, God, that you would be honored through the proclamation of Scripture, and we pray that the songs that have been sung and the words that have already been offered today, Lord, have been uh, a fragrance of a sweet-smelling incense to you, Lord. And so, we just now, as we go into this time where we listen to what you would have to say to us through the Scripture, Lord, we pray that you would speak loudly and clearly and boldly to each one. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, in World War II, back in the 20th century, there was a new tactic that was used in military strategy, both by Germany and the Allied forces, that involved psychological warfare. And it was a very effective strategy. It didn't involve firing any bombs or uh, any missiles or, or uh, didn't involve tanks or military or any kind of weapon uh, that would be actually fired uh, upon another person. But it involved loudspeakers. And these loudspeakers would be utilized when there was a lull in battle. And this strategy was very effective to causing different soldiers to surrender or capitulate to the enemy. And what would happen is during this time of lull in the battle, when, when soldiers were in their trenches or when soldiers were sort of hunkered down in, in, in a protective place, the enemy would take loudspeakers and they would blast messages to the enemy for long periods of time. As soon as the firing stopped, there would be this message that would be played. It would be something like this. It would be uh, something like, London has surrendered. Or, your President Roosevelt has uh, totally surrendered. Give up. Things like, you are completely surrounded. There is an army that is uh, completely surrounded you. You have no chance of survival if you do not surrender. Any kind of message that would, number one, discourage the enemy. But in many cases, not only did it discourage the enemy, but those who had been in the trenches and had been in war for long periods of time and were mentally and emotionally exhausted, not only did they just get discouraged, many of them heard these messages over and over again, and eventually, in the weakness of their mind, began to believe those messages. And when they began to believe those messages, they would often even rise up out of their trenches with a white flag and surrender to the enemy, only to discover later that it was propaganda and misinformation and that all the lies that had been propagated to them over the loudspeakers were not truths at all. You know, as believers, I think we need to realize that as we are engaged in a spiritual battle, that we need to understand that our adversary uses a mountain of propaganda that comes at us on a daily basis. It comes at us moment by moment, and he is bombarding us with information that tries to not only discourage us, but it makes us want to even capitulate or, or even leads us away from our hope and our freedom that we would have in Christ. And the enemy then takes us captive. 
See, the enemy is trying to convince you to believe misinformation about this world, about God, about others, and even about you, you things about yourself that simply are not true. And as we believe those things, we become imprisoned to those false realities. You know, anthropologists even call it, as you, if you go into anthropological studies, and uh, they, they talk about being prisoners of culture. That as we are growing up, and as we are entering into a culture, and as we live and as we dwell in a culture, we hear information that comes at us constantly. From the time that we are born, from the time that we come out of our mother's womb, there is information and data that is coming at us that is convincing us of the realities of this world. And that data shapes our morality. It shapes our belief system. It shapes uh, our practice. It shapes our worldview you. And and anthropologists say that data that comes at you constantly, that is what captivates you, and you ultimately become conformed to that, because that is what you believe. And so they say you are basically a prisoner of your culture. And And the Bible reminds us, however, that as we are prisoners of our culture, that there are certain parts of our culture that we need to be liberated from, that we need to be set free from because they are not rooted in the reality of what God has for us in Scripture. In fact, Romans reminds us this in Romans chapter uh, 12, verse 2. Paul writes this. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. What does he mean by the patterns of the world? He's talking about the cultures, the thing that the the culture has been telling you and telling you to conform to from the time that you were born to the present, the information that is coming to you. And Paul says, wait a second here. There are certain elements of that culture, of those patterns, that you as believers, you understand that is not rooted in reality, and you will not conform to that. You are conforming to something else. In fact, he goes on and says, but instead of being conformed to the patterns of this world or the cultures of this world, he says, be transformed. That, that we as believers are set free from the shackles of culture and we are transformed into something that even transcends culture. And it says, and this happens by the renewing of your mind, as, as the spirit has control of your mind, you realize what is wrong in culture and you are liberated from that. And then he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, per- pleasing, and perfect will. See, there are parts of our culture that we hear every single day that we need to resist and we need to discern to see if it's really propaganda or if it's really the will of God for your life. See, I believe that as children of God, there are many voices that we need to challenge in this world that we need to say is not rooted in the reality of Christ that has been propagated over and over and over again and that we buy into, but we as believers say, no, that is not the reality of what God has for us. You see, here's the reality of the situation, that if we do begin to believe in those lies, many of them will lead us to dry lakes. You know, we're in the middle of a series called um, Lessons in Faith from a Dying Lake. If you remember last week, we talked about the Salton Sea, how it was formed back in the early part of the 20th century. For uh, 18 months, the Colorado River flowed into the desert in the middle of California in this basin, and it filled up with water. But after that 18 months, the water was diverted and it never started going, it didn't go back into this basin area and very little water was coming into this, this lake, this new formed lake called the Salton Sea. Very little water was coming in and no water was going out. And over the last hundred years, it has been it become an evaporating lake that has just been dying slowly, toxic. Nothing can live inside of this lake. And reality is is that sometimes that is a a metaphor for our lives as we are not being filled with Christ and we're not acting upon the living waters of Christ and and we become this sort of dying lake or this sort of uh, 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 individual that is not teeming with the life that Christ wants us to have in how we walk with him. But as we 
are constantly receiving the lies of culture and acting on those lies. If we are not careful, we become like this dying lake without the life of Christ dwelling within us. And I think that this week, Paul reminds the Colossian church to be careful about what they are allowing to enter into their minds and what they are believing, what they are hearing and what they are filling up with so that they don't become prisoners of culture, which will result in a stagnant faith. Notice what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He says, initially he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Notice, Paul says that there are certain things here that are being blasted over the loudspeakers of life. And they are trying to take you captive. Notice what the text says. Make sure that no one takes you captive. In fact, the word that he uses there, it is a military term that Paul is saying. And he says that you can become prisoners of war if you are listening to the wrong kind of information. And he provides four things in, uh, specifically. Notice what he says first of all. He says in verse uh, 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Now, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about the wisdom of the day. As he writes in uh, 1 Corinthians, he says, you know, the philosophy of the day is drawing people away from Christ. See, at that time, Greek philosophy was the latest craze. It was the latest learning. It was new. It was sophisticated. It was trendy. All the smart people were diving into this philosophy, and they were embracing this philosophy. But the problem is with philosophy, and the problem with man's wisdom is that it is always changing. And what we thought was certain, you know, 500 years ago is no longer certain today. Or what we thought is certain today, we see, you know, that that really isn't what what really is going to be certain in the future to come. In fact, you you know, you think of this, um, you know, several hundred years ago, they were still using leeches in their hospitals, you know. When's the last time you were at the hospital and they brought out a big jar of leeches to suck the blood out of you? Because, it, you, you know, there was poison in the blood. And so, you, you know, you start covering people with leeches and all that poison gets sucked out and voila, you're healthy again. You know, next time you go to the doctor, just ask, hey, can I have a big jar of leeches and see what the doctor says? <laughs> Say, what? That doesn't make any sense. But, you know, 500 years ago, that was it. That was the latest wisdom. That was the knowledge of humanity. Let's use leeches. But it, it's not just in the medical field that things are changing. It's, it's in the scientific realm. It's in the moral realm. It's in the philosophical realm. It's in all these different realms we see through the patterns of history that the wisdom of man is constantly shifting. It's constantly changing. And Paul says, do not be sucked into the wisdom of man, which is philosophy. Don't be taken captive by the latest ideas because the latest ideas aren't always the best. And they will deceive you. And that's what he says. Secondly, notice what he says. He says also, instead of this, see that no one takes you captive by empty deceit. He says that there are many things that you hear that are simply deceptive. They're empty words. They have no substance to them. And to make matters worse, they, will, uh, they are designed specifically to deceive you. And you say, well, what are, who are they designed by? Well, if, if you look in Scripture, the, our enemy is called the father of lies. And, and our enemy, Satan, is, he fabricates lies for the people on this planet to buy into, to lead us away from the truth that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul says that much of what we are hearing in this world that is taking us captive today 
is from the enemy. In fact, you, you know, John says it this way. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, our enemy, Satan, he has nothing to do with truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And what that is, is that we are being warned against much of the belief systems that are coming at us and much of the things that culture is teaching us today are rooted in the father of lies who perpetuates lies to take you captive and to take you away from what Christ wants you to believe about reality. There's lies about what will make you happy, lies about what will make you secure, what will fulfill you, what your purpose is, what right and wrong is, what the meaning of life is. And when you believe upon those lies and then you act upon those lies, not only does it take your vitality, your spiritual vitality, and we become these lifeless lakes, it takes us captive from the freedom and the, and the life and the, 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 the vitality that Christ wants us to have in him and in him alone. But notice, he, he says philosophy, and then he says empty deceit, but then there are two other things. He says, according to human traditions and elemental spirits. Now, I like to lump those together because really what those are referring to or what Paul is referring to here is what is called, I call, low-level information, right? You have God information, and then you have human and spirit information. And what Paul is saying is that God information is lofty and human tradition and elemental spirits, basic spirits, they've got the low information. And what's happening is that people were beginning to buy into the low level information, such as human tradition. You know, the the Jewish sect at that time was telling people that they had to buy into certain regulations You had to eat certain types of food. You had to act certain ways. You had to behave in certain manners. You had to observe certain days, rule after rule after rule that was rooted in human tradition. And that was causing people to be taken captive to human tradition rather than the freedom that we have in Christ. And that was all based on low information. Humans were coming up with all of this. And Paul says, God never came up with this. This is all human stuff. This is traditions based on human culture. Don't be taken captive to this lower level of information. In fact, the the scripture, the Lord tells us in Isaiah, he says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Why are you buying into low level information when you have access to the highest thoughts encompassed in Christ? In fact, let let me illustrate it this way. Suppose, you know, you're a graduate student uh, or a medical student. Either way, you know, you're taking quantum physics or, you know, you're taking your brain surgery class uh, uh, as you're going into med school. And and so you gather there in your class and you have, you know, a couple dozen people there in your class waiting to hear the rich knowledge of a professor in quantum physics or brain surgery or whatever it is. And so as you're gathering, you're eagerly anticipating for the rich knowledge of this. And so you wait and you wait and eventually a professor walks in. But the professor walks in and they're five years old. And they come in with a stack of papers, you know, and they hand these papers out. And and as soon as they hand the papers out, you look and you see that there's a coloring page in front of you. And, And then the professor hands out some crayons to you. And the professor, this five-year-old, stands up and says, Good morning, everybody. We're going to practice coloring today. We want you to stay within the lines. You're going to say, wait a second. We're looking at quantum physics, and I'm learning about coloring and staying within the lines? That is low-level information or brain surgery on how to, you know, cut nerves and everything within the complicated human brain or, or, you know, the, the mind here. How how do you, and now we're going down to stay within the lines. That's low level information. And listen, that's what Paul is saying. When you are just working on human traditions, you are working on coloring in the lines. 
When God is calling us to much loftier knowledge of him and, and much greater truths and greater freedoms that are encapsulated in knowing Christ. And so Paul here, he warns the church that, that, that they would need to be careful that nothing would draw them away from the loftiness of Christ himself and, and be seduced into the beckoning calls of, uh, of these loudspeakers over our lives that lead to foolishness and, and destructiveness and lead us and take us away uh, from Christ and take us captive. See, in all of this, you, you, you need to understand, and we need to know this, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. I just understand what the scripture says about our enemy. But we need to know this. We need to be fully aware of this as we walk through this world, that much of what you hear is not truth. That much of what you read is not in the reality that Christ would want us to be living in. That much of what you see is untrue propaganda. Even some of the things that you hear from pulpits and churches across the globe on a Sunday morning is not rooted in the reality that Christ wants us to be rooted in. And it is leading us away and taking us captive from the freedoms that we have in Christ. So I put number one on your outline. If you're following along this morning, jot it down. I put, I need to cautiously evaluate the propaganda that is trying to influence me, that is, is, is influencing me, that is trying to influence my life and take me captive and pull me away from Christ. See, what is coming in and what am I listening to that is shaping me? That's an important question to answer. It really is for each of us in the body of Christ. What am I believing because that is shaping me? What am I holding on to? Because if it's not from Christ, it's taking us captive and it's leading to this sort of dry lake syndrome in our life. And for the Colossians church, he says, you, you know, believers, you, you know, Paul just says, hey, you know, there's so many things trying to take you away from what Christ wants to offer for you. Be careful that you don't become drying lakes and that you don't become a captive uh, prisoner of war in this battle. In fact, you know what he says to the church of the, the Galatian church in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. They were experiencing the exact same thing that the Colossian church was experiencing. The problem is, is that they had already been taken captive, many of them. And he says this, he says, are, are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He says, you've been taken captive by these ideas from the flesh and the works of flesh and these low-level traditions after you've had the lofty thoughts of God. And, he, and you can almost see him just pulling his hair out saying, are you that dumb? <laughs> are you that foolish? Why would you give up the lofty things of God? to the untruths, but listen, that's what often happens when we are in the trenches for long periods of time. And Paul says, be careful. Be careful that you hold on to the truths of God. But notice what he says next. Drop your eyes down to verse nine and 10. He says, in verse nine, he says, now for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now, now let's just stop there for a minute and then we'll look at the second part in verse 10 here. It says, first of all, this has already been established in chapter one, where in chapter one, Paul says that Christ is the exact representation of the father. In fact, that Christ is fully God, that the fullness of God dwelt in the physical body of Christ. All right, so what Paul is doing here is he is addressing another false teaching that was coming into the Colossian church. We talked about it in chapter one briefly. It was called Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism argued was that Jesus was only an emanation, that, that he was not actually a physical being. He looked like a physical being, but he really wasn't a physical being because for the Gnostics, the material and the spiritual could never commingle. 
You see, the material was corrupt. It was evil. It was fallen while the spiritual was pristine without blemish and perfect. And so there was no way that there could be a meeting of the spiritual and the physical. And so there's no way that the spiritual God could somehow dwell within the body of an individual. Well, Paul is going to crush that and say that is simply not true here when it comes to Christ. That, that Christ, in fact, the fullness of God was dwelling within the physical body of Christ. But not only is it a present in Christ, this is where it gets exciting. He says, it's also in you. Notice. He says, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You have been filled in him. Now, the question is, what have you been filled with? We know that we have been filled in him, but filled with what? Well, Paul tells us in his prayer for the uh, Ephesian church, he says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, he says, may you know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's high level information. And when you receive that and when you are in that, notice what it says. Is the effects are that you may be filled with, what does it say there? Filled with all the fullness of of God. Notice, the spiritual collides with the physical again. Paul is saying this idea of Gnosticism and the separation of God and man is obliterated, where in fact the spiritual comes and even dwells and fills humanity. So, so what is he even saying here? Is he saying, well, you know, well, are you saying, Pastor Chad, you know that we are little gods? You know, we're filled with the fullness of God? No, I'm not saying that at all. In fact, We could never contain the fullness of God. You you know, I've got a little jar here, and and suppose I were to take this jar down to the Pacific Ocean, Manila Bay, and, and I were to drop it into the water. Now, would the whole ocean be contained in this jar? You know, as I looked in, all the ocean, the Manila Bay becomes empty because it's all contained in this jar. You would say, absolutely not. There is no way that the ocean could be fully contained in this jar, but this jar could be filled with the ocean, right? It could be filled to even overflowing. And I think that there is only one container that was able to fully contain the fullness of the the entirety of the divine, and that was in the body and in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Because Christ was the God-man. He was entirely capable of containing the fullness of God. But for us, we can dip ourselves, as we are in Christ, we are dipping ourselves in God and being filled to overflowing with uh, God's essence, his likeness, his knowledge, or the knowledge of his will, his grace, his presence, and his glory. And Paul says, oh, that you would be filled with him. Isn't that a great thought? You know, that, that idea that flesh was, you know, this separation between flesh and spirit is is obliterated for the Gnostic. But Paul is also, he's not only just dealing with the Gnostic here, I think he's dealing with sort of the preconceived notions that were in the Jewish culture as well. You see, in ancient times, in the Old Testament, in order to be in the presence of the Lord, where would you go? You would go to the temple or you would go to the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, literally, mean that, that just means the dwelling place. That's all that word means, is the dwelling place or dwelling. And so this is a place where God would tabernacle with man, he would, where he would dwell. And, and he would, this intersecting point with God and humanity. And in the temple, just this is a sort of a picture of the temple. And, and you would enter in and you'd go into the outer courtyard past the uh, altar of offering and the laver where you'd purify yourself. And there was a table of showbread and a menorah and an altar of incense. And then there was this veil that separated the holy of holies where God would reside with sort of all of the rest of the world. And this was the dwelling place of God. In fact, in the, on the Ark of the Covenant, this is the Ark of the Covenant, right here between the wings of the cherubim was sort of this encountering place of God. The Shekinah glory of God would show up. In fact, in Exodus chapter 25, 22, 
It says, it was at that spot that I will meet you. And the glory of the Lord would fill this temple. And even in 1 Kings, it says, as the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the priest couldn't even stand there because the glory of the Lord was so overwhelming. And so in the Jewish mindset, oh, if you want to meet with God, if you want to have an encounter with God, well, it's right there in between the, the wings of the cherubim. And God was distant. And Paul, he says, no, that's not it at all. In the New Testament, he teaches us that God is no longer in tabernacles or in a building or at the mercy seat or this, this in between the, the, the wings of the cherubim. Instead, as we are in Christ, he fills us and he is tabernacling in us as we dip ourselves in Christ. We are filled with his presence and his glory that resides in us. In fact, Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, don't you know? It's like, you, you should know this. That you are God's temple. Got that? You are God's tabernacle. That's where he's dwelling. And that the God's spirit dwells within you. It's no longer in the Holy of Holies. It is in you. You are now the tabernacle. And so he says, you know, because you're, he's, you're the tabernacle, well, this temple that you're in, have, you need to make sure that it's holy. But it's interesting to me that most every religious system sort of places God at a distant, far away, that we sort of, he's out there. How can I get to him? But in our faith, in Christ, God is not far away. He is brought near. He is brought in and he even dwells within us. And we are filled with the glory of God's presence in us. Let me ask you, when you are filled with him, think about this for a minute. If you are filled with the glory of God in you, what more is there to accomplish in this life? What greater objective can you master in this life that you would strive for? What better things are there to attain? In this being filled with the glory of God, there is a lack for nothing. There is completion. So as to leave nothing wanting in our lives. What else can you fill your life with that's better than that? There is nothing you can grab from religion, learning, or wisdom, or, or organization, or jobs, or uh, th that will advance you, or to make you more complete or perfected th than being filled with him. Listen, beloved. You are filled with the fullness of God. Let that sink in. Look to somebody next to you. Tell them, you are filled with the fullness of God. Of God in Christ Jesus. That is, a, that is a, the loftiest thought that I can give you today. It's one of the loftiest thoughts that I can give you in any conversation that we have. That you are filled with the fullness of God. He is in you. What can more can we add to that? In this we are made extraordinary in Christ Jesus. In fact, let me go back to my jar here. A jar of clay. It literally is a jar of clay. The Bible says that you are jars of clay, that we are jars of clay. And, you know, this one's nice. It's been painted. Somebody made it for me. It's got a little you help me grow thing on it. It's a nice little little jar, right? They've, they've spruced it up really good. Now, now, if I were to take my jar and I were to give it to somebody out here and say, hey, listen, you want my jar? You'd go, oh, yeah, that's a nice little jar. Okay, you put it on your desk or whatnot. And it, it sits on my desk. I put pins in my jar, right? It just sits there. And, uh, but but an empty jar, you know, it's, it's not all that impressive. But l let me say this. L what if I were to say now, take this jar, instead of being what I use it for, and I were to now fill it. Now, what I fill it with will determine its value, right? Let's say I fill it with dirt and I give it to you. Hey, here's my jar full of dirt. Oh, that's nice. You might plant some seeds in there and maybe something will grow. You, it's a nice sentiment, but really, if you're going to move a far distance, you'll probably leave it behind, right? Or, you know, if I, I fill it with water, okay, that's great. Great, lovely water. Thank you. Uh, you're not going to insult me and say that my jar of clay is not that impressive, but we all know that my jar of clay is not that impressive, but let's say I fill it with 
diamonds, right? <laughs> diamonds that now it's worth millions and millions of dollars. I mean, if you fill this up with diamonds, you've got millions and millions of dollars. Do you think I'm going to set it on my desk and put pens in it? You know, <laughs> all of a sudden, this becomes extraordinary, not because of the jar of clay, but because of what fills the jar of clay. The Bible tells us that you are the jars of clay, that we are made out of the earth. And so we are these jars of clay. But in Christ, we are being filled with the fullness of God. As you look at one another, that should make us think everyone that we see who is in Christ is absolutely extraordinary because we are being filled with the fullness of God. And and this extraordinary value, it doesn't come from philosophy. It doesn't come from elemental spirits or human traditions. You will never be filled with the fullness of God through those things. You will only be filled with the fullness of God and made complete in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul is trying to teach us here, that everything that we try to add in or fill our lives with to bring value or to bring us meaning is nothing next to the fact of being in Christ and being filled with the fullness of God in us. There is nothing more, there is nothing better than that. Beloved, you are filled in him. You are filled with him. He is in you. And sometimes I think we go year after year embracing the nonsense and the lies that are being perpetuated in our world that tell us I'm not rich enough. They're telling us things like I'm not good looking enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not successful enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not confident enough. I'm not, 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 not. I'm all of these things that I am not. And those are being perpetuated. And the loudspeakers are coming in and and teaching us these things. When when in fact, the Bible reminds us that because we are in Christ and we are filled with Christ, we are are his children. We are are, uh, gifted with the immeasurable riches of Jesus Christ, that we are given eternal life, that we have grace, that that we are filled with him, that what what greater or loftier thing could could we have in our life? What, What greater value could we add to our lives than knowing that we are filled with him? And yet our, our culture today, I mean, you know, you're, you're not even that important. You know, even some of our evolutionary uh, theories that are out there are, are teaching us that we're just matter, that we're just material. In fact, Stephen J. Gould, scientist, he says this. He says, you know, we're here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures because the earth never froze entirely during the ice age. And because a small and tenuous species arising from Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. Eh, You're an accident. In fact, that's what uh, physicist Lawrence Krauss says. He says that this planet is just a cosmic accident. And listen, if we buy into that over and over again, we wonder why, you know, suicide rates are high. We, we wonder why there's hopelessness. We wonder why there's despair. Because being a cosmic accident is a lousy philosophy to live by. It is one that does not put intrinsic value in humanity. But being filled with the fullness of God brings purpose. It brings meaning. It brings value. To every person who is found in Christ Jesus. See, the voices are calling over the loudspeakers of life, trying to take you captive, calling you to meaninglessness, calling you to a lower status of life and futility. But we are not just a bunch of empty goo. We are not just an accident. We are filled with the fullness of God. I put number two on your outline. Jot it down. I need to remember that I am being filled with the fullness of God. I am being filled with the fullness of God. If I am in Christ, that is one of the best, most blessed messages that we could hang on to in this world. 
And in that, we lack nothing. We don't lack purpose. We have the glory that is filling us as he fills us. I love how Alexander McLaren, theologian and pastor, he wrote it uh, over 100 years ago. He said this. He said, though all the earth were covered with helpers and lovers of my soul, as the sand by the seashore innumerable, and all the heavens were sown with faces of angels who cared for me, all could not do for me what I need. Though all these were gathered into one mighty and loving creature, even he were not sufficient stay for one soul of man. Notice what he says. He says, we want more and we need more than a creature help. We need the whole fullness of the Godhead to draw upon us, to draw from. It is all there in Christ for each of us. Whosoever will, let him draw freely. Why should we leave the fountains of living water to hew out for ourselves with infinite pain, broken cisterns or broken wells that hold no water? All we need is in Christ. Lift, let us lift up our eyes from the low earth, low level learning here. And all creatures, and behold, no man any more as Lord and helper, save only Jesus. Oh, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Listen, if we're going to be teeming with life, if we're going to avoid this dead lake syndrome, let us fill up with his fullness. There are few things that will bring us greater vitality in our lives than an awareness of who we are in Christ Jesus. In fact, that's what John reminds us of in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. He says it so, so gently and so delicately and so kindly to the believers. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. What is he talking about? He's talking about spirits and false voices and, and the culture that's coming in and bombarding you and, and trying to tear you away from uh, 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 the truth of God and take you captive. He, he says, no, no, you aren't going to be conquered by them. You're not going to be taken captive by then. He says, in fact, you have overcome them. Why? For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And he says, stop this quest for lower meaning. Know who is in you and know who you are. He is greater than anything in this world. And let nothing take you captive. Let nothing take you away from that truth. You know, several years ago, a friend of mine was going through a very challenging, well, a very challenging season in her life. And she was a songwriter, a musician, and, and so she wrote me a song uh, he wrote a song who, uh, uh, and sent it to me to review it for theology. And she, the, the song goes like this. She says, after she talks about the struggles that she's going through, she says, Lord, remind me of who I am in you. I know, Lord, you make all things new. The old is gone and the new has come. So remind me of who I am in you. And then she goes on in this bridge and she says, I'm redeemed, I'm loved, and I have peace. You sing over me and I'm healed. I have hope and I've been made complete. So Lord, remind me of who I am in you. Beloved, I think that's what Paul is trying to do here. He's saying, don't be captivated by the things that the world is trying to convince you of. But be reminded who you are in Christ, that you are being filled with the fullness of God. And I don't know what issues you have going on in your life and the struggles that are going on in your life and the, and the false reality and the false loudspeaker noise that you have been listening to. But some of us need to put that aside and say, I need to get back and listen to what Christ is telling me about who I am. I need to get back being in Christ and, and, and allowing his word to come in and saturate me so that I may be teeming with life again. I, I think this is the essence of what Paul is trying to communicate here to the Colossian church. Don't lose sight of who you are 
in Christ and what you have in him. Because what you have in Christ and who you are in him, it is simply magnificent. And in having that, you will be filled with the vitality and life and and teeming with just freshness when we continually come back and we are reminded of who we are in Christ. Beloved, don't forget who you are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, my prayer for all who are viewing this morning, afternoon or evening, my prayer, Lord, is that they would be reminded that they are filled with the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. And that whatever burden or whatever false reality that they've been buying into in these battles and and trenches of life, Lord, that you would renew them this morning and bring a fresh sense of vitality into their lives with the knowledge of being filled with the fullness of God. We ask this in your name. Amen. receive our morning benediction together. According to the riches of his glory, may he grant you the strength and power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen and amen. God bless and have a great week this week. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Faith. I serve in the children's ministry. Christmas is the season to give more love, to help those who are severely affected by the pandemic, 
The UCM Christmas Giving Project provides two ways for us to share the love of Christ. Donate 500 pesos for a Christmas gift bag filled with food items. The gift bags will be distributed to families in three needy communities in Antipolo. Another way to give is to donate any amount of cash to UCM on behalf of your family and friends and help our brothers and sisters in need. Let your loved ones know that you have made a donation in their name by sending them a greeting card to be provided to you by UCM. Just scan the QR code to participate. Details are posted on the Union Church of Manila Facebook page and in the Church Bulletin. The Cancer Overcomers Support Group and Mental Health Care Ministries invite you to advanced care planning in the new normal, designed to openly discuss with family members and friends personal plans in case of COVID-19 infection or the possibility of being diagnosed with a life-threatening condition. Speaker is Ruth Foundation's Dr. May Corvera. Please scan the QR code to register. You don't have to go through the grieving process alone. You're invited to join a caring group who will help you through one of life's most difficult experiences. Join the online Grief Share Seminar, Mondays, beginning October 26. Just email the address on your screen to register. To get full access to the online Sunday School lessons, email children at unionchurch.ph to register. Connect with us by liking the Kingdom Kids Facebook page. Come and join a time of scriptural reflection and prayer during the Midweek Essentials, Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Each year, the Nominations Committee recommends candidates to the Council to replace outgoing Council members. If you know of anyone who is willing to serve, please fill out the form on the nominations page of the website. There are many ways of giving your offering to the church, such as through direct bank deposits, online funds transfer, or simply drop it off at UCM. If you need to remain at home, please call the church for your check to be picked up. This year, we are celebrating the 106th anniversary of Union Church of Manila. Praise God for His faithfulness. Join us again for worship next Sunday. God bless.